You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. It is early September, a time of year filled with rituals for many of us. There's back to school, of course. For many, there are also new routines and new habits, and for others, there is a familiar sense of returning to the same old grind after a summer of long weekends and adventures. And now, in this pandemic era, there is a new September ritual. The annual attempt by management to bring office workers out of their home offices and back to the company office. Now, if you watch the workplace, and of course, if you participate in this little push and pull, you'll be very familiar with how this has gone so far. Management announces a return to office rule. Some workers come back. Others shrug their shoulders and hope nobody notices. And a few more look for new jobs. And then, a few weeks later, a fall return of COVID infections makes the whole thing irrelevant for a while. This year, though, many companies say they are all in on return to office mandates, including, ironically one of the companies that made remote work possible. Now, workers have seen this film before, so you'll forgive them if some of them are no longer willing to pay attention or show up at work, not if they have other options. So will this fall be the last time we do the return to office dance? And if not, why not? Can't we just settle this once and for all? Final round, fight! I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Dr. Catherine Connolly is a professor of human resources and management at McMaster University. Hey, Dr. Connolly. Hey, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. As this uh, September begins, it feels like... Maybe we're at a final tipping point for return to work, working from home, back to the office, etc. Is there, is there a percentage we can look at now and quantify what percentage of office workers have actually gone back? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. So the, uh, the estimates will vary a little bit, but most people would say that there are maybe 15 to 20 percent of workplaces that offer nothing in terms of no flexibility have to be in the office. About the same proportion completely work from home. And then everybody else is sort of in between where they're expected to work maybe between one and three days uh, a week at the office and the rest is up to them. So we wanted to talk to you as September begins this year because it's felt for the past couple of years like we're still figuring the post-pandemic working world out, right? Like, you know, when are companies really going to push for return to office? If they will, when will workers push back? So I'm going to ask you, like, is this the final time that we have to settle this? Like, it can't, it can't go on forever with being like, this time companies really mean it, right? Like, at some point we have to decide, okay, this is the way we work now. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that old Monty Python sketch where the police officer says, stop, or I'll say stop again. Right. And so we've had a little bit about uh, of this. I think Apple is maybe the best example where they were threatening people like, okay, now we mean it, but there'd be so much pushback that it would be delayed and delayed. And then they'd and make another announcement and then it would be delayed. I, I don't actually think it will ever be fully settled. And it's just the way businesses work, where they will try different things, see how that goes, see what their competitors do, and then try something else, right? So I think we've, we've always had um, changes like this. So I think we'll, we'll continue to see that in different permutations, combinations, even as the technology improves or as uh, the labor market changes. Has it changed that much over the past, let's say, year or so? Like if we were having this conversation one year ago, have more people come back to work since then? Are companies pushing yet again this fall in a way maybe they didn't do last year? Or is this just like, is this going to be every September? Now, who goes back to work and who doesn't? 
Yeah, so I think the type of conversations we're having now just have qualitatively changed a little bit uh, since this time last year. So this time last year, maybe it's hard to to remember, but uh, we were still having more of an emphasis on COVID right. in terms of the threat that that posed and people uh, wanting to not be in the office for health reasons. And that may well happen here any day now. Yeah, I mean, COVID is absolutely still with us. But I, I think it just hasn't dominated the conversations that we've been having in the same way that it did before. Right. But I would say that the specificity of the conversations is a little bit different. So maybe a year ago, people were or companies were settling for even just one day. <laughs> just please come in at any point. We'll be delighted with all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then now it's a, a lot more specificity where they're saying, no, it has to be uh, three days a week or a certain amount of time. And it has to be in this specific office. Are employees complying? No. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> no, I mean, I think part of it is uh, managers are not always interested in in having this. Um, and then if they're not leading the way on it, then like like it's hard for a manager to insist on all their uh, direct reports to come in if they're not going to be there. So no, no, it, it certainly has not been uh, a one to one compliance at all. There have been a number, you mentioned Apple and how that kind of fizzled out, but there have been a number of high profile examples of companies trying to mandate return to office recently. Can you just maybe run us through those and just, you know, give us your thoughts on how it looks from an HR perspective in terms of like, once you say this, what has to happen next? Okay, yeah. So Amazon, I think, is maybe uh, one of the more high profile examples. And so they were telling people back in February, okay, Everybody from now on, three days a week, starting in May. Okay, go. And then when it actually came to, to be May, uh, then employees received this email saying, we have noticed that you have not been coming into work in your designated area at least three times a week, at least three out of the four last weeks. Hmm. And so what they were doing was they were tracking people using their pass cards if they were coming in and when they were going. And so these are employees who are not used to being treated that way. Not used to being treated like the warehouse workers, the way Amazon treats them. Well, exactly, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, maybe it's not surprising that Amazon came up with this, <laughs> this process right. to begin with. I mean, they had that technology in place, but... But yeah, the reaction was was really negative. And um, these are workers who have other options. And so th there's a lot of concerns about the accuracy of the tracking. And also, like, what is the, the reasoning behind this, right? Is it really necessary to, to go this way? Well, let me ask you about that, because I was going to save this question for later, but it seems uh, relevant now. What is the reasoning behind it from a productivity standpoint? You know, I've, I've had obviously a few conversations about return to office uh, over the past few years on this show. And originally, you know, we had data from pre-pandemic remote work studies and companies who wanted to try something different and try to save money or be more proactive. By now, we should have, like, in the thick of it data that's reliable. What do we know about uh, working from home's impact on productivity? Yeah, so the, the data is really difficult to compare in terms of before pandemic, during pandemic, and now. Right. Right? So if, if you look at the older data before pandemic, it was not really like an apples to apples comparison. So it was almost like if you were doing any telecommuting, as they used to call it, you were sort of unusual. And there would be maybe specific reasons why you were allowed to do that, that might have something to do with your seniority or your job. It's just such an unusual case. So to compare those productivity numbers to somebody else's, um, it was kind of difficult to do that. And then also their definition of telecommuting in those old papers was also different. So basically, if you worked from home one day a month, they would put you in that category of telecommuting just because it was so rare. Hmm. And then fast forward to early days of the pandemic. I mean, <laughs> it was uh, in some cases just a bit of a disaster, but nothing to do with the uh, 
telecommuting or the remote or the hybrid aspect is because of COVID, yeah. right? So people were sick, their kids were sick, their kids were being homeschooled. So like you can't really trust those numbers either, right? And then so now we're left with the numbers we're collecting now. And it's still the case where you get pockets where people will say, absolutely, way more productive, it's working really well. And others, will, they will say, absolutely not, it's the opposite. And so then you have to start looking, okay, well, why? Mm -hmm. And has a lot to do with uh, the direct supervisor, the type of work people are doing, just the, the management style at the company, like how senior they are. I mean, it, it's a lot uh, harder on someone who's very junior and still trying to figure out how they're supposed to do stuff right? compared to someone who's very senior and they've been doing this. They could do their job in their sleep. They know exactly what to do. From a human resources point of view, and maybe, you know, if you were consulting for some of these companies, and I'll ask it like both ways. First of all, from that point of view, why would companies want their workers back in the office as much as possible? Right. So the companies that are really pushing for people to be in person, um, they're usually doing this more with like a, a long term perspective where they think that when people come together, informally in these small micro interactions with each other, that they're going to build trust with each other and that this is going to mean better working relationships when people need it. So for example, if you're in the office, you're waiting for the elevator, you talk about your garden, your pets, your kids, the Thai cats game, things like that. And it's just little, it's just here and there. Um, but over time, you kind of get to know these people, even though you don't work with them kind of know who that person is and that they seem okay. Right. Right. And then later when you need help from that other department or you're merging or there's some kind of weird crisis and nobody knows, then you have a contact, you can talk to them, you trust what they are saying to you. And it's, it's just saving the company a lot of grief. Right. But it's, it's an unpredictable thing about like, when will people need help? When it's, it's difficult to quantify. And then on the other side of that, you have what I imagine might be a little bit of resentment from simply employees. Like, I mean, listen, I've been a manager in my time. Employees don't like to be told exactly what they have to do. They like to have options and be able to figure out how to do their job best for them. And I think, you know, you just mentioned Amazon tracking employees and the kind of pushback that Apple got. A, a lot of that must come from, like, it's difficult to, to mandate professionals to do those kind of things. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So I think one of the best predictors of job satisfaction is how much autonomy people have. Right. And people like that feeling of I'm able to structure my day the way I want to. I can do things in the order that I want to do them. And I can accomplish tasks at the pace that I want to accomplish them. And so a lot of professional workers, they they find when they're at home, there are fewer distractions. They can just get more work done in a way that is more enjoyable for them. So it feels more like a, like a craftsmanship mm -hmm. in terms of how they're approaching things rather than just, oh, okay, I do everything that people tell me and I'm just a cog in the machine. And then on top of that, there's all the work-life balance issues. Right. So if people work from home, they can go for a run at lunch or they can walk their dog or it's easier for them to look after their kids before and after school. Right. So it's just they can start supper and they can eat more healthy. They can save money on the commute. Like it's such a, a long list of just so very tangible things that affect maybe not the job satisfaction so much, but the life satisfaction for sure. How much of this, and this is what I find so fascinating about this topic and why uh, we keep returning to it around this time, because I know from previous episodes that employers absolutely, uh, unless it's in your contract, that you have the right to work remotely. Employers can tell you, get back to the office or you don't have a job anymore. But on the other side of that, the employer doesn't want that person to simply say no. And then they have to deal with, okay, what do I do now, right? Like, it, it feels, it really feels to me like we're at this fascinating impasse. Yeah, so I think we would not be in this situation if uh, the unemployment rate were a lot higher. So 
I, I have heard people say, oh, no, it's great. Like if you have to reduce your headcount, you just enforce work from home. And then that's great. People will quit and you don't even have to pay severance. Huh. And to me, this is the most absurd, <laughs> ridiculous thing because you're going to lose people, but you will lose your best people. Right. Because right. they have options anywhere, like not just your competitor across the street. It could be like across the province, like it could be anywhere, really. And so especially your most senior people who are excellent, well-networked, they, they will have so many other options. What would you tell a company to do who really wanted their workers back in the office, thought it was important for all the reasons you've kind of already illustrated um, and was dealing with pushback? So I would empower the managers, the line managers, to exercise as much leeway and granularity, discretion, basically, in terms of how they would implement this policy. Right. So I think companies fail the most when they have a one size fits all policy. Mm -hmm. And so they will, in an effort to be fair, right? So they, they are trying to be as fair as possible. So they will say, okay, the same rule for everybody. But the thing is, people have different needs, right? And so if there is a way to address people's individual concerns with coming to the office, then it's possible that they could encourage people to come in more frequently without it being uh, mandatory. So for example, if there are people who just find the office so distracting, then okay, find out, can they actually have an office with a door that closes, mm -hmm. right? Maybe there's more space. Maybe this is a, a possibility now. If the issue is uh, that they find that they benefit from the flexibility, well, okay, maybe they could still have flexible hours. Maybe it doesn't have to be nine to five, if their location has to be fixed. And then the other thing would be to try to coordinate as much as possible how the work from the office days are going along with the work from the home days. Because you've probably heard stories from colleagues where you come in on your day to be at the office and you are the only person there. I have experienced so, that firsthand, yes, in fact. Yes, and so you're still on Zoom but you're just in your uncomfortable office chair and uh, everybody else is at home with their pets. How do companies account for, because we're speaking of fairness here, employees that have been hired during the pandemic who may have remote work clauses in their contract or who may just simply live too far from the office for commuting to be viable uh, versus employees who have not moved away uh, during the pandemic and so are are ready to come back to the office, even if, or at least are available to come back to the office, even if they might not want to. You just mentioned kind of a one-size-fits-all policy. I can easily see, and I think it was either Amazon or Zoom that kind of set a boundary of like 60 kilometers or 80 kilometers and said, anybody within this circle, you got to come back, everybody else, no. How do you manage that? And does it do any good for like the morale of your team? Yeah, so I think there's definitely going to be some resentment. Right. Especially if people feel that they are the most productive, that they have the least amount of flexibility. Right. And so if that's the case, then people will either reduce their productivity, which is what you don't want, um, or they'll find ways to increase their flexibility, which is also presumably what you don't want, or they'll they'll leave or they'll be very vocal. Right. And then leave. <laughs> and so but the thing is, in organizations, people are not always treated exactly the same way in that people are paid different amounts, people are uh, given different tasks, some are more interesting, some are less interesting. And so there's often a little bit of variation um, in terms of how people are treated. But the trick is often um, how well this is explained, right? And so if there's somebody who's been grandfathered in in terms of they are allowed to do this because we hired them and they we knew they lived 90 kilometers away and they are the only person who does this one task and they don't really need to be face to face with us. And so that is the reason why they can do that. But I'm sorry, you cannot. I have a very cynical question for you. How much of this is about empty real estate that is sunk costs for employers and they can't get rid of it? You can't sell it now because it's uh, worth way less than it was and downtown's an empty shell and you got to do something with it because you're stuck with it. Yeah, I sometimes wonder that too. I mean, when you look at some of the uh, corporate campuses, like even uh, Nortel back in the day, 
I mean, these were beautiful, right? And it was um, a way for the company to communicate that, wow, we have this address, right? Um, in downtown Toronto, this huge building, we take up this many floors and it, it's so big and impressive, right? And so you should invest in our company and buy all of, all of our products. And so I wonder a little bit about that. I also sometimes wonder about the offices that the decision makers have. I have a feeling that they have a really nice office with a door that closes. Mm. They probably have nice plants in their office. They probably have like a nice washroom, all this stuff, right? That our ordinary workers in a cubicle, a rickety chair, a sad computer screen, like it's just not the same, right? So I think there's sometimes a bit of momentum mm -hmm. where companies gotten kind of used to having this address and they have an idea in their mind of like what working there means and what it looks like. But the reality is kind of different. Given the situation we've been in for the last few years, and it's been scary, it's been stressful, um, and even now as we're coming out of it, you know, the economy is tough. How important is it for a uh, company and managers to just keep their people happy, even if it means not being able to enforce return to office protocols that they might like to? Or just is it simply more important to hammer down and, and get the most value out of them for your company? I actually think that turnover is way more expensive than people realize mm. and that it's actually more profitable to keep people happy. And so the rule of thumb that uh, we use is that turnover will cost a company 150% of an individual's salary, right? So if somebody is making $100,000 a year, it'll cost the company $150,000 to replace them. And Part of this is the lost productivity when they're kind of planning on leaving and then the lack of productivity when there's nobody in that role and then low productivity when the new person comes in. Right. There's also all these costs for the manager of like posting the job, interviewing all the people, going through that stack of resumes, training the new person, the disruption with the clients. Like it's incredibly expensive. And that's assuming that you can find somebody relatively quickly. and. Maybe you cannot. Sure. And so if you have a good person in the role, I think it's way cheaper to try to keep them engaged and keep them involved than to just say, oh, fine, quit. If you don't like it, just leave. Because it's just, it's so much more work to try to get somebody new into that, that position than what you had before. One last question from the other side now. Uh, what advice would you give to an employee? And here, let's say they're being told to report back to the office and who simply, like for life, work balance reasons, whatever, really does not want to do it. What are their options? What would you recommend? So, I mean, they do have the option of leaving. And I would say every five years or so, at a minimum, employees should be testing the waters outside their company. Interesting. So it, it could be that they, will find that, no, they actually have a really good level of pay and responsibilities and everything where they are. So they might come away from that process actually feeling that, no, I'm in the right position for me. Or they might see what's out there and think, oh, actually, no, I am 30% underpaid and I should go elsewhere so that I can be valued for what I contribute. So, so I think employees should be keeping an eye on what is out there. If there's one aspect of their job that they really do not like, and that's the commute. They might consider, okay, is there something that would make up for that? And so often it's money, right? And so it's certainly worth asking what your compensation rate could be changed to. Or if it's not that, maybe you want different responsibilities or something like that. So it, it's definitely important to kind of Think about what other parts of your role would make a difference. Dr. Connolly, thank you for this. A really fascinating conversation. And uh, maybe we'll call you back next year at this time and see, see who actually gave in. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much for having me. That's Dr. Catherine Connolly of McMaster University. And that was the big story. If it interests you at all to know this, I recorded, as mentioned, with Dr. Connolly, the interview for this story from The Office. I am recording 
the introduction and the outro for this episode from my basement studio. See? Flexible work. It's the future. You can find all the episodes of The Big Story at thebigstorypodcast.ca. And of course, you can get in touch with us in many ways to tell us many things or just pay us a compliment or an insult. You can find us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN. You can email us by sending one to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. And you can call to rant and rave or talk politely and calmly in a civil tone by calling 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available absolutely everywhere. And we need you to tell your friends about this podcast because they'll like it too. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.